Hey there, it's Jason Stahl with another episode of Body Shop Business, the podcast. And today I have a very special guest whose name you might remember or recognize from the pages of Body Shop Business. He writes a lot of our succession planning and retirement planning content. It is Matt DeFrancesco. He is the principal of High Lift Financial. Welcome, Matthew. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate being here. You're welcome. And it's so awesome that you were happen to be in the area today and you could stop by the studio. Oh, uh, I know. It's just, you know, we kind of just threw it together, had coffee this morning, and we're able to put this together. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So, Matt, tell me a little bit about High Lift Financial, what the company is, and what you do there. Okay. So, basically, uh, High Lift Financial, we're a full service financial firm, uh, and we specialize working with collision shop owners. Um, because of some of the unique situations that they run into, and especially about the demographic. And um, I think a lot of body shop owners are, you know, they're great at their business, run successful businesses, but they have no idea how to create something even bigger than that. And really what my goal is, and my tagline is really helping to align their business and family for generational wealth. Mm -hmm. You know, again, they've got this great asset that they've built up over the years, and how can they use, uh, how can they utilize that either to continue it on for multi generations, or if they have a liquidity event, how do they then utilize that to create generational wealth that can pass from their kids, grandkids, and down multi generations? And I think it's important to point out you are a specialist in this in, in auto in the auto body industry. You right. specialize in auto body shops, correct? That's exactly right. Okay, That's exactly right. Okay, what is the number one mistake you see that collision repair facility owners make when they are looking to the future, looking to pass on their shop to their employees or family, or looking to get out of the business? What's the number one mistake they make? Well, I think the first thing is one thing to keep in mind is how many how many collision shop owners are going to exit their business, and it's all of them at some point. All right, whether it's through a retirement, whether it's through a transition, whether it's through death, you know, disability, anything like that. So a business a shop owner always has to be preparing for whatever that transition is going to be. And a lot of them don't. So what happens is they get to a point where they're 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 burned out. They're tired of you know fighting the insurance companies. They're tired. They can't find techs, and it just it all gets overwhelming. And they just want to get out, but they're really not in a financial position to live the lifestyle that they want, even with that liquidity event. See, many times, and part of the initial process I do with clients is kind of helping them to develop a personal vision. What does this post-business life look like? And then, you know, what, you know, what do we have as assets? What's the value of the business? And, and nine times out of 10, I find a gap, all right? And so that means that either they got to scale back the lifestyle that they want, or we've got to build value somewhere. And a lot of times that's with the business. So I think the biggest problem is that they start too late. I think, you know, Mike Anderson and I had a conversation a little while ago, and Mike, I think, put it perfectly. He said, every move you make as a shop owner should have your transition in mind, your succession mm. in mind. Is it crazy to say that, I mean, let's say you start a new shop, like day one, you should be thinking of your exit plan on day one. Is it crazy to say that? No, it's not crazy at all to say mm. that because everything you do, again, you know, if you do things like, you know, start figuring out how do I provide employees incentives? do retention programs? How do I build proper systems to be able to uh, maximize the value of the business? So every step that you make should always have in mind what, you know, not only how am I going to grow the business, but how am I going to maximize the value of the business? So they kind of go hand in hand to a certain extent, but there's too many shop owners that do a really good job. They push really good revenue, but when you finally get down to the numbers, they're not, they don't have the cash flow and which, uh, which in turn means they don't have the valuation that they actually that they actually thought think they they have. Mm -hmm. You made an interesting point in a recent article we published of yours mm -hmm. that, you know, if you're a shop owner that wants to get out but you want to still kind of be involved in the business, that's an option too, right? Correct. Correct. I always say that <laughs> you can take the boy out of the shop, but you can't take the shop out of the boy. I run into a lot of owners that they're, you know, they're considering this exit plan, considering what they want to do, but they have this turmoil because 
it's like, well, then what do I do with my my life? And that's really a key area that that I work with shop owners on. Um, you know, if they're doing an internal transfer, which that's kind of where I, I I I basically am the implementer of that plan. So whether it's a family member or an insider, or they're going to do a third party sale, we have to create a personal vision, what they want their life to look like, and then again. How does, how does this transition fit into this? So, for example, I got a guy I'm working with who um, he's training, he wants to transfer the business to his key employee. Um, but he wasn't sure if the guy was willing or capable of doing it. Uh, he could sell to a consolidator, but he was like, well, then what do I do with myself? And I've got a garage with my car collection, and, and I like to work on, on my own cars, and what am I going to do with that? So we're designing solutions that can still allow him to, if he wants to work on a pet project or do a restoration, he can still do that, but not have to be in the day-to-day -day activities of the business. Matt, let's talk about valuation, yeah. a shop's worth. It, 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 through your articles, you, you, you repeat the theme that seems like a lot of shop owners way overvalue their shop without knowing the actual true value of it. Right. Talk to me about, give me an example of that maybe that you've run through or tell me why they are uh, a, a uh, their heads in the clouds as far as this value goes. Right. So I think, I think the first thing to preface is valuation is a very, um, it's a very fluid term. So if they're like saying, "Hey, I want to sell to a consolidator," there's a very specific way that um, that that business should be valued. And typically, if I've got a, if I've got a, a, a prospect or a shop owner that's coming to me and saying you know, we don't have any kids that are in the business, none of our key employees, we just want to sell to a consolidator. I typically send them to a, uh, an M&A person that will do the valuation and, and tell them, here's what the local market looks like and here's what your value is going to be. If we're doing an internal transfer, that's sometimes a little different story. We don't need quite that formal of one. But still, you know, there's a lot of little things that, that, shop, that uh, shop owners miss. So I'll give you an example. I was working with a shop owner who um, uh, he wanted to sell the business to his son, and his son wanted to buy the business. He says, I'll sell it to you for five million bucks. And I was like, where'd you come up with that number? It just sounded like a good number. So we started doing, we, we started looking at the financials, um, you know, kind of figuring out what his free cash flow was, uh, looking at the internal systems. And a shop that was doing almost $4 million, we found out was really only valued about 795000 because he didn't have good cash flow, he was too over debt, and he was shocked. He was shocked by that that number, and so it's not always just about. We sometimes we think it's a determinant of the of the revenue that we're doing, but it really comes down to free cash flow, and that's why consolidators are looking to buy shops is because they like the cash flow that come from very well run shops. So again, this whole idea of valuation, I think it's a good idea, even if you're not ready to exit or thinking about third party sale, get at least a basic valuation so you know where you stand. And that's one of the things that I do with clients is, you know, we'll, we'll sit down, we'll do this kind of base valuation. And then as we're put, implementing different strategies, I can show them how it's actually uh, raising the value of the business. It's called a dynamic revaluation. So now they can see, wow, what these different, these things I'm doing are actually raising the value of it. You said something that made me think about something, consolidator, selling to a consolidator. What are the advantages to selling to, say, a independent single store or two store MSO versus a mid market uh, consolidator versus a one of the big four. Right. I, I think it really comes down to what your personal goals are. And, and you know, ultimately it's probably gonna be what, you know, who's gonna pay you the most money. All right. Um, you know, the big consolidator stores, it's, you know, to me, they're like the Home Depots, the Walmarts of the world. You know, it's very homogenous. They've got basic systems. Everything's kind of run the same. Um, your mid-market MSOs, uh, some of them are, you know, allow you to kind of maintain something of an identity that you had. Again, if you're looking at a shop that's looking to purchase other shops, a lot of times they're, they want to kind of keep that local presence that, that you have and the reputation that you've built. So they can vary, they're kind of all over the board. I think it really comes down to what your ultimate goal is and what you want to do, uh, you know, as far as selling to a consolidator. Matt, is it ever too late to plan your exit strategy? In other words, if you've never thought for a minute about how you're getting out of the business or how to sell your business, is it is it ever too late? And, and then if when you start, 
you know, how long does it take? Three years, five years, seven years? Yeah. Well, it becomes too late if all of a sudden you become, you can't run your business anymore, whether it's death, disability, divorce, um, yeah, any, any of those type of things. Um, you know, one of the basic building blocks that I do with clients is build a, a business continuity plan in, and that's putting in business continuity instructions so that your key employees and your loved ones know, you know, who are, who are the people I need to contact right off the bat? Uh, who are my advisors that you need to talk to? Who are key customers that I need to, uh, to ensure? Who's going to fill which roles that I, full, that I do that? Um, spouses, how is their income going to be taken care of in case something happens? So that's when it becomes too late. So I think that's a real critical thing right off the bat that every shop owner needs to do is build those business continuity plans. Um, the ideal time frame, um, you know, it, it's like we said, you know, Mike Anderson says everything you do. I think, the, you know, ideally, if you, once you start your shop, it, you should start, you know, start doing it. You know, typically a, you know, if you're in a five to seven year window, that's really a good time because it gives us time to analyze where you are, figure out where you're vulnerable, and then start to build value in the business. So when that eventual time comes, you know, you're in a good position to do that. And it's, it's, it's probably the time frame is more important with an insider transfer because there's certain, you know, you need to train people to do things. You need your kids. A lot of times they, you know, owners think that the kids learn is through osmosis. And all of a sudden they get into the business and they're like, well, wait, I'm, what's my kid doing? He doesn't know what the heck he's doing. Well, yeah, because they never really taught. And maybe they know how to fix a car, but do they understand the business aspects of the business? Right. And, I, you know, I want to bring up another reason, a good reason to be prepared. And it's something that you brought up in your past articles. Don't want to be too morbid, but we all think we're going to live forever, right? Right. And you never know, you know, you could drop dead of a heart attack tomorrow. Exactly. And then where's your business, right? So right. another good reason to be prepared, correct? Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah. and, and, and there's little things that, that you miss, like how are you going to put the financial vehicles if something happens to you to make sure that either there's, there's money in the business to be able to uh, hire somebody to come and run maybe the CEO portion of it or, you know, to be able to compensate you know, your key people to take on a, a greater responsibility or to make sure that there's funds there that the company can buy out a spouse, if a surviving spouse or, you know, or whoever's, you know, might be the heir apparent in there. So yeah, the, the planning takes on, it can really take on a lot of uh, uh, very deep dimensions. The other thing is buy-sell agreements. And if, they, if you've got a partnership in the business, uh, I can't tell you how many buy sells agreements that I see. If they've got term life insurance policies are there, and that's it. And there's nothing in there about. First off, there's no permanent insurance. Nothing funded by the company. There's um, there's no agreements and settlements. If something should happen, um, there's there's provisions you could put in. That's called Texas shootout, where if you know if there's a disagreement between the two owners. Um, one has a right of re first refusal. They can make an offer. The other one can say yes or no and then say, this is the offer, and then they have to agree to that. So there's, there's all these different prov provisions in buy-sell agreements. So these are all little things that just, uh, you know, that I think every shop owner needs to look at. And in my experience, most of them don't. Hmm. You know, and we always talk about the guys who want to leave or are leaving. Yeah. We don't talk about the guys who are in it for the long haul. There are a lot of body shops today, a lot of young operators or older operators who see opportunity in the future, and they're investing in their shop for ADOS, they're investing for electric vehicles. Right. But uh, it sounds like, according to you, there's really no difference whether you're in it for the long haul or you want to leave uh, in a few years, you've got a plan, right? Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, it's interesting. I've got a client of mine, a very successful one, we're a very successful shop. He's got a son that's in the business and also a key guy. They're killing it. And eventually, originally, when we started working together, he was talking about the transition plan and talking about how he, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, how they're going to take over the business. But as we evolved, we started to realize that you know what? It's not that he wanted to leave the business, but he wanted to take a different role. What he really loved doing was building culture. Okay, and so where we've been evolving the business is allowing him to take more of that fifty thousand foot view, building the culture of the business. Um, you know, building up his employees, um, and then his son and key guy do more of the operational work. But, you know, again, 
And in, in this case, you know, we took his business. We made we we looked to make a C corp out of it, and now he's just on the board of directors. He gets he gets money for being on the board of directors, and he can also have his fingers in, but he doesn't have to be in the day to day operations. And I think I think the thing that burns out um, shop owners the most is having to deal with just the day to the insurance company, trying to get the money that they're owed, trying to get the labor rates that they need, and um, and then trying to find tax. And if uh, if an owner could get out of that, but still be able to have some input in the business, that can be a very appealing thing too. So really, again, comes down to helping them to form that personal vision. 10 words or less to tell a shop today who was woefully unprepared to exit, but they want to exit in five years, 10 words or less, what do you tell them? <laughs> you're going to give me 10. Yeah, yeah you're, you don't know me that well. 10 words or less. How about call yeah. me? <laughs> That's right, exactly. That's yeah. really what it comes down to. I think just uh, you know, calling me, let's do an evaluation of your shop and, um, and, and see where the areas that you're vulnerable. And like I, you know, and, and I tell shop owners this, we do an analysis. I mean, you can hire me or not, but at least you know where, where your weak, weak points are and the things that you need to work on. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for stopping in. It was so great that you were in Cleveland today and able to stop in the studio. Really appreciate the advice. No uh, there's a lot of shop owners right now that are you know, looking to get out, uh, and there's a lot of shop owners who are looking to the future. But in either case, they need to plan, right? Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. And actually, um, so, I, and again, I don't know when this podcast is coming out, but um, uh, Laura Gay and I are going to be at the uh, Northeast 2024 show in Secaucus, New Jersey. And we're actually going to be hosting a lunch and learn on building value in your business with your exit in mind. And, and of course, Laura is going to be taking, you know, from a third party, from a consolidator uh, uh, position. I'm going to be just talking about building general value, making it more appealing to the um, uh, to the consolidator and also looking at the, that internal transfer, if that's something the shop owner wants to do. That event sounds like something that repairers cannot miss. Yeah, I, yeah. we're hoping. It's a, we, it was kind of put together at the last minute, um, so we're kind of doing it word of mouth. So we're hoping that uh, there's uh, shop owners out there that see the value in that and just enjoy a lunch and just uh, try to learn a little bit more about how to build value in your business. Sure. Thanks again, Matt. No problem, Jason. I appreciate you having me. I'm Jason Stahl. Thanks for watching. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to Body Shop Business, the podcast. Check out BodyShopBusiness.com for more podcasts.